I went to Rio Art Fair recently. Art Rio, or Archie Rio. It was the usual kind of stuff. Some good painting. That's what I always say to myself when I come away from these events, particularly since I've been trying to cultivate a more positive outlook. Some good painting. In reality, I often think the modern art fair quite depressing, with its countless galleries from around the world, each of which has its own little booth, each of which has its own little gallerist sitting at their own little glass table, each of whom has their MacBook open and is sipping from a bottle of mineral water and wearing an unbuttoned grey blazer. And there are all these people milling around, looking at a variety of sculptures, paintings, installations, works that are invariably neon-coloured, directly or indirectly depicting the collapse of our culture. Note, neon is nihilism's colour palette. I'd already done a lap and was looking for the exit. Some good painting, I was saying to myself again and again, like a mantra. As I did, something caught my attention. Beyond the main exhibits, in a separate marquee, was a part of the fair I'd missed entirely. A section devoted to indigenous art. I decided to stick around for a bit longer, and I'm glad I did, because I found this painting. Ostensibly, it's a picture of a member of the Huni Kuin administering Sananga. The Huni Kuin are an indigenous people of Acre, a southwestern part of the Amazon. There are four particularly important medicines that they employ ceremonially as part of their religious tradition Sananga, Cambo, Hape, and Ayahuasca. Sananga, which you can see being administered here, is eye drops made from the ground up roots of a flowering plant. It's painful. The drops burn. It's like rubbing chilies into your eyes. But after a few minutes the pain subsides, your eyes stop watering and you can see clearly again. You can see clearer than before, even. Indeed, outside of the ceremonial context, Sananga is also taken by men before they depart for hunting trips. Anyway, the subject of this painting isn't what I want to talk about. I want to talk about that neck. It makes me think of the paintings on the walls of the Chauvet Cave, documented here by Werner Herzog in his 2010 film The Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Look at these images of bears and horses and lions. There's something similar going on. Perhaps this is unsurprising. We're talking about two cultures who, despite being separated by tens of thousands of years of historical time, both live with and in nature. But it's more than that. There's something unique about a people who still live in this way, about their depiction of natural forms. It's what in the field of art history is called naive art, or more commonly, primitivism. Picasso dabbled in it, Gauguin too. But perhaps its most famous exemplar is Henri Rousseau, who incidentally never once set foot in a rainforest. A kind of genuine meta-naivety which manifested beautifully in his work. But this is all beside the point, because for the Huni Kuin it's a style called Maku. Maku being an acronym for the Huni Kuin artistic movement, are paintings inspired by the chants customarily performed at Nixipai ceremonies. Nixipai, or as it's more commonly known in the West, Ayahuasca, is the great plant teacher at the centre of many indigenous people's religious life. I'm still trying to work out what's so appealing about that neck, with its lack of anatomical veracity about that lack of what, certainly post-Renaissance, we might call technical mastery. There's an honesty here, a childishness even, 
But for Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung, quote, naive childishness has in it the seeds of creativity and can never be suppressed or replaced by rationality. Yeah, there's something truer here, something more in touch with the part of the psyche that's longing to make sense of the world in which it finds itself. A part of the psyche that is endlessly curious, endlessly unsatisfied on its quest to rejoin itself with itself. The sculptor Henry Moore echoed Jung when he wrote, The most striking quality common to all primitive art is its intense vitality. It is something made by a people with a direct and immediate response to life. An interesting parallel to the development of the artistic method that occurred during the Renaissance might be the development of religious institutions which really took off during the same period. Interestingly, the word religion comes from Latin religio, meaning to reconnect. Because that's what art is about, or what it used to be about. For civilization has a tendency to put things between things. Where the growth of institutions started putting churches, priests, dogma, between the individual and God, shamanism, our oldest religion, tells its adherents, eat this or drink this and go and find out for yourself. There is no mediator here. Agency, sanctity is granted the individual as he or she seeks to understand themselves in relation to whatever lies beyond. So in a similar way, an objective standard of what constitutes good art, which until the last hundred years was predicated by standards set by the so-called masters of the Renaissance. Suddenly the art world was indeed an art world. There were schools, institutions, there were rules. But did all these inhibit something else, something deeper? Do they really contribute to the production of work which is more beautiful? Or on the path to ultimate perfection, did our Western art lose something? In Jung, the literal truth of a painting is irrelevant anyway. For him, quote, a work of art must relate to something that does not appear in its visible form. Because paintings are only ever symbolic, they can represent reality, but they can never be that reality themselves. Their value lies in their ability to guide us back to ourselves. So back to that neck. I'm wondering if there's a correlation here. A correlation between our understanding of anatomy and our ability to depict it in art and our lack of understanding of ourselves. Of course, by understanding of ourselves, I'm not talking physiologically or even psychologically. I'm not talking in reductionist terms. As already discussed, the revolutions of the Renaissance kick-started a period of technological development that ever since has continued to develop exponentially. But all this has inevitably taken us away from the forests, the earth, our origins, the wellspring of our existence, from the deeper, more cohesive substrate of spiritual reality which our ancestors knew so intimately. For these reasons, the Maku paintings of the Hunikuin should be treasured. They're a link to another age in all their awkward, bent out of shape beauty. Herein, writes Jung, lies the significance of art. It is constantly at work educating the spirit of its time, conjuring up the forms in which the age is most lacking. When I got home after the art fair, I tried to make my body bend back in that way, like in the painting. I strained and strained and got to like 70 degrees. I've done a bit of yoga here and there, but I couldn't get there. Not nearly. However, I like to think that once I'd recovered from the ensuing head rush, I'd have smiled. I'd been kind of dreading the art fair, but I was glad I'd gone. My neck hurt, but something made sense. <laughs>